Dr. Caffrey here. Our topic for discussion today is does gluten sensitivity really exist? And we're going to review a fairly recent study on non-celiac wheat and gluten sensitivity. So this study was published in 2016 in the journal Gut and the study was entitled Intestinal Cell Damage and Systemic Immune Activation in individuals reporting sensitivity to wheat in the absence of celiac disease. So the conclusion of the study was these findings reveal a state of systemic immune activation, meaning full body, in conjunction with a compromised intestinal epithelium, meaning your gut barrier, affecting a subset of individuals who experience sensitivity to wheat in the absence of celiac disease and autoimmune disease. So how did they determine these individuals had non-celiac gluten sensitivity or non-celiac wheat sensitivity? Well, it was based upon self-reported symptoms, non-specific symptoms in response to gluten ingestion, GI symptoms and or extra intestinal, meaning outside the gut, symptoms. Some of the most common ones were bloating, pain, diarrhea, fatigue, headache, anxiety, and cognitive difficulties, things like brain fog. And then they saw resolution of these aforementioned symptoms with dietary restriction of gluten. And then in those same individuals, celiac and wheat allergy was excluded. So they reported these symptoms, they got better with removing gluten, and they excluded celiac, autoimmune conditioning, it's a small intestine, which is known to be triggered by gluten, and wheat allergy. So they took some measurements on these individuals uh, in the study. They had 80 individuals with non-celiac wheat sensitivity, 40 with celiac, and 40 that served as healthy controls. They did biopsies, they did, um, took some blood samples, and looked at questionnaires. Well, what did they find? Well, in the non-celiac wheat sensitivity individuals, so these are the individuals with the self-reported reactions to wheat or gluten, they saw translocation of microbial products. What that means is bacteria in the gut or bacterial waste products in the gut uh, were able to get past the barrier, the cells in the gut, and into the bloodstream. They saw systemic immune activation, which means when those waste products get into the bloodstream, that provokes an inflammatory response or an immune response, and they saw that in these individuals. And they saw intestinal epithelial damage. They saw damage to the actual barrier in the gut. So these three things are represented in this illustration below. This um, illustration is not taken from the actual study, uh, but it demonstrates these things quite well. If you look at the green items, this represents the bacteria in the gut or the bacterial waste products in the gut. And you see they're able to translocate or cross the gut barrier because there's uh, damage to the epithelium or the gut barrier itself and a widening between the gut, these gap junctions in the gut. And this is something that will lead to a inflammatory or a systemic immune response. So what did they measure that reflected these things? Well, in these non-celiac wheat sensitivity individuals, they saw significantly increased serum levels of soluble CD14, and this was something that was an indication of translocation of lipopolysaccharides, which are these waste products in the gut. They saw increased LPS binding protein, which is again an indication of translocation of these waste products in the gut. And they saw this when compared to the healthy controls and the celiac controls. They also saw increased fatty acid binding protein, which was a marker of intestinal epithelial cell damage, barrier damage in the gut. Uh, this was something that was elevated in both the non-celiac wheat sensitivity individuals as well as the celiac individuals, which makes sense because celiac is an autoimmune condition against the intestines and you would expect some damage to the intestines to be done. They also saw higher levels of endotoxin core antibodies. This is something, again, a reflection of uh, waste products getting into the bloodstream, getting past that gut barrier. 
and they saw reactions to uh, a flagellin protein, which is a protein constituent of uh, these bacteria in the gut. And they saw this when compared to healthy controls and the celiac controls. They also saw reactivity to gliadin. Uh, gliadin is a component of gluten, uh, which individuals can react to. They saw IgG, IgA, and IgM antibodies to this. These are just different types of uh, immune responses, and these were all higher than the healthy control groups. And they also noted that um, there was no association between this reaction and the presence of HLA-DQ2 or DQ8 genotypes, which are the genes that are present in celiac individuals. They also did note that they saw some IgA reactivity, which is immune reactivity, certain type of immune reactivity that is more specific to the gut barrier um, in the celiac group. So what did they do? They took these individuals off gluten, six months off uh, gluten, so a gluten-free diet, and then they looked at some of these parameters again. And what they found was they found reduced translocation of these microbial products, they found less systemic immune activation, and less intestinal epithelial damage. So all these things we just mentioned and talked about improved. So all reported improvements in symptoms uh, all subjects had reported improvements in symptoms, and intestinal and extra intestinal symptom scores all got better in all the subjects. Uh, the measurements taken before and after six months of gluten-free diet in non-celiac wheat sensitivity individuals showed improvement as well. Uh, significant normalization of immune markers. They saw a decline in these various antibodies or immune reactions to gliadin, um, LBP, which was that uh, lipopolysaccharide binding protein and some of these other markers that represent basically immune reactions to gut bacteria or their waste products or actual um, indications of damage to the barrier in the gut itself. So they also hypothesized in this study that some of these circulating or circulating bacterial components ultimately lead to activation of certain types of immune responses and activations of certain types of cells or receptors called toll-like receptors and activation of certain transcription factors called nuclear factor kappa beta, which lead to this systemic or full body uh, inflammatory state. And this is something that is known to occur with translocation of these waste products from these bacteria. Um, and they postulated that some of these mechanisms might be contributory to some of the symptoms that we see in non-celiac gluten sensitivity or non-celiac wheat sensitivity, like the neurocognitive symptom effects. So some previous studies have shown that some of your most common symptoms reported in non-celiac wheat sensitivity are fatigue and brain fog, so these neurocognitive type, type issues. So the ultimate conclusion of the study was objective evidence of systemic immune activation, barrier compromise, and microbial translocation was present in non-celiac wheat sensitivity. So this was a good study um, that looked at a number of individuals with self-reported symptoms, but they objectified things by looking at all these immune markers and bacterial markers uh, and markers that uh, could lead to or represent inflammatory states in the body. And they showed that these things did occur uh, with individuals that had self-reported non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And then they did improve when these individuals ultimately got off gluten for a period of six months. I'm Dr. Caffrey. Thank you for listening.